for attending uh, what um, for me is a, a real honor to have someone that I've learned from on two procedures. And one is aesthetic crown lengthening and the other uh, is gingival depigmentation. Uh, Waleed and I have been close friends for years. I have high respect for him. His articles are done exceptionally well. Uh, he has an article in the International Journal of Perry and Restorative Dentistry uh, that was in January of 2022, which is actually the very first randomized control trial on uh, what one would call aesthetic closed crown lengthening. Uh, you can see that uh, he has accolades, a master and a PhD in periodontics. Uh, I know him through the Academy of Laser Dentistry uh, where he is the secretary, but he has a mastership and advanced proficiency uh, with the Academy of Laser Dentistry, uh, part of the Academy of Laser Dentistry Speakers Bureau. He practices in Qatar, uh, but for Europe and the Middle East, uh, Walid is considered to be the resource on the subjects that uh, you're going to hear tonight. And as you do, please, um, as Joe suggested, put some uh, questions, comments uh, in the Q&A. And when we finish this, um, I'll monitor, but Waleed will be able to answer your questions. So Waleed, my friend, it's yours. Thank you, Dr. Law. Uh, thank you, Joe. And thank you, for Biolis, for uh, this nice invitation and give me the chance to share some of our work with our colleague. Uh, today, we'll talk about two procedures, mainly about using laser in periodontal aesthetic. The first procedure, the aesthetic crown lengthening, and we make it very short for the depigmentations. Uh, we know today there is a tremendous focus in cosmetic dentistry. And in addition to the aesthetic dentistry, the priority of the patients to get some kind of dental uh, procedure with minimal invasive and get, uh, comfort and this chair time and this appointment. And this is the modern dentistry. And we'll explore during this hour how the laser can serve all these four concepts, the aesthetic, minimal invasive, and comfort, and this chair time and appointment. And today we realize there is much more to aesthetic smile than simply the teeth. It's not related only about the white, related about the harmony and the relation between lip and gum and teeth to get together. And this is, will be our interest that the smile is very important. And we get, when you meet someone for the first time, you get impression about his personality more than 47% in the cases from his smile. So the smile is a huge topic and a huge demand. As I mentioned, smiles not only about the teeth, we have to think about soft tissue aesthetic integrations. And when we talk about bank aesthetic, we can specifically define gingival level and gingival contour texture and the color. The first three points, the level and contour and text texture of the gingiva, this we can control with the, our procedure is to the crown lengthening and changing the gingival color. This is will be the topic of the depigmentations. And it's not only about is the crown lengthening. We know in the crown lengthening, in most of the cases, we need it for the restorations. And here's we have to understand how to give, to place this restoration with respecting of the biology, to get what we call it the bioesthetic, to create the natural form and function. And this is will provide us with the quality of the beauty. So when we have restoration, will be another indication for the crown lengthening. So crown lengthening as a procedure, if we return to the fundamental, 
with simple word, we can define it. The crown lengthening increasing the amount of subgingival root structure. This the increasing we can do it in coronal direction, like ortho extrusions or by restoration, or in the apical direction through changing the level of the gingival margin. In regard, when we move the margin apically, this is the surgical crown lengthening in the period. And for the indication, we can distinguish between two main indications. The first indication, when we have restoration, we want to place restoration in some cases of some gingival caries, a fracture tooth. When we have short teeth and we need to increase the height to get some kind of very tension and to avoid the violation of biological wedge. All these indications, indication for functional crown lengthening. And mostly this is we do it in the all aspect of the tooth, mesial, distal, buccal, lingual, or palatal. The other main indication, and this is our topic today, the aesthetic, that's what we call it the gingival labial crown lengthening. This indication for the cases in the upper maxillary teeth, in maxillary teeth in the anterior zone. So we mainly do this procedure to correct the gingival level, to give some kind of harmonious contouring of the gum and to treat one famous case, what we call the altered passive eruptions or the gummy smile. Gummy smile is very well known by lay person. And this nice article published in American Academy of Biodontology tell us how, what's the importance of the uh, smile in general, and how the smile will be affected by excessive gingival display or what we call the gummy smile. It's not only about the beauty, not only about the attractiveness. This smile, this uh, gummy smile can affect the perception of the people about the personality for any guy. How is he friendly about trustworthy, intelligence and self-confidence? So the smile in this case is the ID of your personality. And we know how this changing of the smile may be affect the perception of the patient and their self-esteem uh, acceptance. For the gummy smile, one of the positive factors is the altered passive eruption. And if we go very fast about this one, this is a procedure, this is uh, this case, situation when gingival margin in adults located incisal to the cervical complexity of the crown. In research, we define this one or when uh, distinguish these cases, when we have the gingival overlap over the 19% of the height of anatomical crown. What we can see, we can see short teeth, square teeth, and gap appearance during the social or emotional smile, more than two milli or three milli according to the reference in the literature. Causelet classified that the passive eruption for two type and two subcategories. And this classification is very important to decide what the kind of the treatment we will go to. First, he take three marker or three reference, the macrogingival junction, bone test, and cementary enamel junction. First, the relation between macrogingival junction and cementary enamel junction. If the macrogingival junction is apical, the cementary enamel junctions, so we have enough attached Keratinized gingiva, this is called the type one. While type two, this is the cases when the macro gingival junction located at the level of cement enamel junction or sometimes coronal bone. So in these cases, we don't have enough attached gingiva. Clinically or clinical wise, all type one A, type one is accepted to give to make gingivectomy or gingival contouring or gingivoplasty, whatever you want to call. While all type two will be contraindication for gingivectomy because you don't have enough attached gingiva. 
So it will be indication for radical nutrition if lab to visit to preserve the attached ginger. The second relation or subcategories is the relation between the bone crest and cement enamel junction. When we have distance more than two mil between cement enamel junction and the bone crest, so in these cases, we don't need to make osteotomy on bone reduction. So we have enough space for supracrystal attached tissue or what we call the pelagic wave. While subcategory B, in these cases, we don't have this distance to a million. So any procedure, we need to create space for our biological wood for the attached tissue. So in general, we can understand now in type 1A to make the crown lengthening is enough to make gingivectomy. In type 1B, you can start with gingivectomy, then you need to raise the flap and make the osteotomy or a bone reduction. In type 2A, it's enough to do a bicali position flap, while in type 2B, we need a bicali position flap plus the bone reduction. So this is the fourth scenario usually we uh, see it and, and we just uh, fi find it in our patient. So as a crown lengthening, surgically crown lengthening, we are dealing with the soft tissue, changing the level of the gum through moving apically by apically position flap when indicated or through the gingivectomy. And as I mentioned, the need for osteotomy is depending about the space that you have it between cement enamel junction and the bone crest. We have four principles for the crown lengthening in general, not only for aesthetic. First, to keep at least space two milli for biological width, and also two milli from keratinized acta gingiva, and respecting the crown root ratio, especially when we are talking about functional crown lengthening and working all around the aspect of the tooth. And of course, when you are dealing with tooth in the anterior zone, especially in the maxilla, we have to consider the aesthetic. So for any case you want to face it with the crown lengthening, you need this reference. First of all, the incisor edge locations. Because you want to make the measurement, the crown lengthening or the crown height is mean the distance between A and B, between the incisor edge and the gingival margins. Also, we need to know the probing depth and location of the bony crest in addition the, to the, the uh, Makujinjival junctions. And we will try to shift the patient from this situation in the left to the right with respecting all the parameters that we mentioned before or all the reference, keeping two milli for biological weight, keeping at least two milli from keratinized attached gingiva. And here's I want to mention something that we focused in our research that we published, we found that cement enamel junction maybe is not reliable or uh, reference. It's very difficult to find it. It's very difficult to distinguish. So in the real life, it's very difficult to get this relation to a milli. And we replaced with something is more valuable or more easy to distinguish and to register. We call it sobra gingival tissue, sobra crystal gingival tissue. This is including the biological width and the free gingiva. So the sulcus plus the biological width. This is we call the sobra crystal gingival tissue. So when we place any restoration in case of functional crown lengthening, we need to keep the distance between the margin of this restoration and the bony crest three milli. So we need at least sobra crystal gingival tissue to be three milli. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we have four scenario for management of altered vasive eruption through the acetic crown lengthening, gingivectomy only, or 
gingivectomy plus reasonable flap. Of course, we're talking about flapless later, or apically position the flap with or without OSS reductions. During my courses, always uh, I mentioned the crown lengthening is maybe is the most common periodontal surgery. We have it in periodontal practice. And as surgery is not delicate, it's not difficult comparing to other periodontal surgeries. But the difficulty in the crown lengthening that we have many referrals, we have many numbers we have to deal with, biological wood, it recognizes that gingiva, uh, how to evaluate the bone, where's the incisal edge, et cetera, et cetera. So I make this roadmap for any case for aesthetic crown lengthening. The first step, we need to evaluate the incisal edge position. And we want to decide. We want to keep the incisal edge in its place or there's possibility to move it apically or coronally. This is, we have to decide it before we start with any periodontal procedure. Because we want to measure the height of the crown. So I need, I measured from this point to this point. So I have to fix the incisal edge and the gingival level will be the changeable point. After that, We need to know how much we want to change the level of the gum. Two milli, three milli, four milli. This is depending about the relation or the golden proportion, the ratio between the width and the height of the tooth. And in average, we take the simple number is 80%. As example, the width is eight, the height will be 10. So we know in this case, we need to increase the height as example, two milli. Now, what the technique or what the approach will use it to change the level of the gum? Will be gingivectomy or a apical position of lap? This is depending how much attached gingiva I will have from the new margins to the macrogingival junction. And we need at least two milli to keep that attached gingiva. And here's always you mentioned the gingivectomy is golden standards when you have enough attached gingiva. Because with gingivectomy, there is more chance to be predictable, and margin will be more predictable than the flap. But in case if you don't have enough attached gingiva, so it will be contraindication to do the gingival contouring. And the fourth step: Do we need to cut the bone or not? This is depending about the space between the new margin to the bone, and we need at least three mil. Why three milli, two milli for biological width, and one milli for the uh, sulcus in the future. So this is the fourth step. And most of the mistake it's having, and if you skip one step or make one step before that, next. So it's very important to how to deal with this step together. Now, most of the cases of active passive eruption is classified type 1B. So the cases you can accept to do gingivectomy because in our research, we found the average attached gingiva we have it in maxillary teeth is 5 to 5.5 mil. So most of the cases accepted to do the gingivectomy, but also need to make osteotomy. So it's subcategory B. And in these cases, you can do usually after the osteotomy, the flap, this is unconventional crown lengthening. You can do it in as one stage of procedure, everything at the same appointment or two stage. So first making the flap, osteotomy, and call the, recall the patient after four to six weeks later, sometimes three months, depending about your plan, and do the gingivectomy. So in two stage, we transfer the patient from type one, B, according to classification, active passive eruption to type 1A. Why we need it? What's the logic behind it? It will be more predictable, as we mentioned, for the gingivectomy. While in one stage of procedure, mostly when the patient comes after the healing time, three months, six months, most of the time you need to recorrect the contour of the gingiva. And this is, we call it retouching. So the question, this is all the information we know it before about the crown lengthening, but what about what we can provide 
today in 2020 for our patients to meet his requirement about aesthetic and minimal invasive procedure and about the pain and this share time. And this is, will be our entrance for laser. And with laser, why, this is my argument about the laser, why I preferred over the conventional methods to do the crown lifting. First, with laser, we have minimal tissue displacement. Second, with laser, we have hemostasis, will improve the visibility. We mentioned all about number, one milli, two milli. In this photo, can you tell me where is zenith? Where is the contour of the gum? Where is the one or two milli? Of course, it's very difficult when you have this bleeding. While with this cutting with erbium chromium laser, it's very easy to define where is the contour, if this contour, exactly this contour, where is the margins, and you can take your measurement easier. We have more stability for the, for the post-operative margin when you're cutting by laser. Less collateral tissue damage, especially when you make the bone reduction, less damage for the root, and less damage for increasing the, the, the thermal damage is happening when we cut it with the rotary. Patient can see result immediately. So for this patient, I can give him the mirror. I can discuss with him the case. While it's very difficult to give photo for this, uh, the mirror for the, this case, because the patient you will see only the bleeding. And with laser, we understand laser, we have the biostimulation effect. We have more pain control, this was operative and pain and the swelling. For all this one, this is the advantage that the laser. And something is very important also. When you are dealing, this is advantage as example, when you are dealing with bone reductions. In more than 80% of the cases, the width or the thickness of the buccal bone is done one mil. So we are dealing with very uh, sensitive area. If we look to the history, we start using the bone chisel, which is a traumatic procedure. The rotary, there is high chance to cut from the cemento. In can bear, it's okay, but still there is chance to cut the cemento. Bezo, it's okay, much better than the rotary, but still there is, high, there is chance to cut from the cemento during the bone reductions. And this is what I think is the golden standard to deal with the buccal bone is with the erbium and the erbium chromium laser because you are dealing with the light. This light you can direct it and dealing with only with the bone without affecting the neighbor tissue. And this is example of the importance when you are dealing with the bone with increasing the temperature and the collathermal damage. We know the bone is very sensitive for increasing of the temperature. When you increase the temperature of bone more than 10 centigrade, you have absolute bone necrosis. While we can see an erbium yad as example, when you are using 200 millijoules, the increasing of the temperature 0.8. This is nice paper from Japan and can tell us that you can notice here with erbium yad and erbium chromium, increasing of the temperature one milli away from the middle of the ablation or or cutting line is this than three degrees. Predictability of the margins. Here's before and here after two months, you can see the stippling of the gum is coming back. This is very rare to find it in the, when you make the cutting by the blade or curriculum knives. Some doctor, they complain against laser, laser not precise, at Blade. I agree the blade is precise, but can you tell me this cutting is precise or not? When you are very familiar how to deal with the setting of your laser or parameter of laser, you can get exactly like this cut. It's very fine cut. Actually, this erbium or chromium cut up to 15 microns. While with the blade, we can't cut 15 microns. Of course, because we don't see 15 microns. While laser using the physics and physics tell us for each pulse, you can cut to 14 microns. So you have more control and you have minimal invasive procedure. That's all, no. The most important thing when we have this technology, we have chance to get innovative approach. 
like the flood sprout. I remember one from, from my professor teach me that the best flap in the periodontal surgery is no flap. We know the flap, why we need the flap in type 1B. It's only to access the bone. So the question, if we access the bone without the flap and make the reduction, how this will change our practice? So we start research in 2014 to compare between flab and flabless bone reduction during the aesthetic crown length. Using the airbeam chromium laser, we have 44 patients, and this is published uh, in January 2022. And this is the team of the research. We have Dr. Sam uh, Lau, we have George Romanos, uh, we have uh, Joseph Arnaba. And uh, this research took from us five years because it was randomized clinical trial is very important, very difficult to find these patients. And we have three main research questions. And all these questions is clinical question. The first, any difference or in the clinical outcome between the flab and the flabless? The second question, what do we have any difference in the positional change comparing to non laser procedure. And another important question, usually I found difficulty to answer my restor restorative dentist. How long to wait after crown lengthening before placing the final restorations? Because I try to read, we don't have a statement to tell us this is three months or six months, nine months, four months, whatever. So this is one of the main questions. We have patient, 44 patients, but we're collecting the data at the end of the research for 56 patients. For all our patients, because everything in the crown lengthening is related for the measurements. All our patients, we make the DSD at start of the procedure. We have the complete digital flow. And we have this mock-up. With this mock-up, we use it as surgical stent and or surgical guide. And also we use the mock-up during the visit after one month, three months, and nine months to measure the changing of the position of the gingival margins. For all the patients, we have CBCT 3D before and 3D after nine months to take the measurement and the changing of the bony crest. For the first group, or the first arm of the study, the open flap surgery. For the open flap surgery, we have the mock-up, as I mentioned, as surgical guide. We use the airbium chromium here. We pick up a small tip, the step uh, MT4, 400 microns, because we need to make, and we begin to mark the margin, the new margins on this mock-up. We mark it for all the teeth. So now this is prosthetic driven periodontal surgery. After that, we begin to make the gingival contouring. But in this case, because we are deciding to make open flap, it will be internal gingivectomy. We finish everything with gingival contouring, we change to other tip, is larger tip. Here's we are using uh, 600 micron sapphire tip. And we begin to make the gingival contouring and we create the scallop of the gum and try to finish everything before you raising the flap. So when you are satisfied 100% about the contour, then making the leveling, to remove the ledge and remove any irregularity in the tissue. Now is the time for the flap. So with the flap, the good thing about using the airbion chromium and the raising the flap, it will be very predictable procedure to make split thickness of flap in the interdental area, which is sometimes delicate and challenging challenge when you are using the blade. 
how to make split thickness flat because here's in the acidic round lengthening, we are dealing only with buccal bone, no need to deal with the interdental bone. So no need to raise the papilla. This papilla will serve later as receive, uh, to receive the suture and the stability of the margin. Now we are using the erbium chromium to ablate the bone. Uh, here's, if you can see in the tooth, I mark before raising the flap using the pencil or the clever pencil, we mark where's the new margin located. So now we need to create scallop shape of the bone this will be parallel to the scallop shape of the gum or following the cemento enamel junction contour. And we create this distance three milli between the new margin of the gum to the bone. This will be the distance that the new attachment will be located and for the circus. As example, here's the distance three milli, not yet. So we're recontouring again. And of course we need to smoothening the bone and remove any ledge and irregularity until we get the space for three mil. Now it's ready to make the suturing. And in this case, it's an aesthetic crown lengthening. We suture it and we place it not apically between flaps, just non displace the flap. We create everything with gingival contouring. So the flap was only used to have access to the bone and we make interrupted suture, not vertical matrix because again this is not apically position flat and who are using the erbium chromium you can see the setting just i want to emphasize in the setting here in gingival contouring i prefer to using the uh, smooth with the uh, 700 microsecond pulse duration this is will give me cutting without very fine cut and we have very regular cut and at the same time the hemostasis is great after that, for the flap incision and of course dealing with the bone, we have to use the short bus duration or the H mode in the I plus. Heavy water irrigation when you are dealing with bone, this is must. This is will improve the cutting and at the same time control the thermal damage. The second group, we decide for this group to make flapless bone reduction. So when we start with this group, you start with making gingival contouring. Example, in this video, we are using MZ6 tip, 600 micron tip, and we're making the gingival contouring again until you will be satisfied 100% about the new contour and remove all regularity of the gum. After that, we will work with the flapless. First, we bring the MC3 tip. This tip, the chisel tip, is very nice because the thickness of this tip is 0 0.3 mil. So it's very easy to in insert it inside then the distance between the gum and the tooth, and you create this pouch. We mark this tip for 3 mil. Here's I mark it 3 and 4. This marker will be the new... Uh, reference for you to know that you create space with the height for three mil. We move the tip in and out movement, heavy water irrigation, more than 80%. And we keep, we take our time. And at this time, of course you are dealing and you create the space, but there is chance to create a trough in the bone. So you're cutting the bone, not some, because the thickness you are dealing with 300 micron. So maybe you cut the bone like this. How to correct this trap? We bring the tip and we rotate it now. When you rotate the tip like this, now you have the width of the tip 1.2 mil. And already you create the pouch. Now we will begin to work in swabbing movements, mesiodistally. And in case if you have the trough here, now you are removing the trough, then you will finish with this shape of the bone. With this shape of the bone, you have chance to have right angle here. So we know we want to make the beveling or bone contouring. Here's we bring tip 600 micron tip. 
And with swabbing movement means your distally. Of course, we minimize the energy or the power setting because now we are dealing only with the buccal bone just to remove the ledge or the right angle of the bone. And we do this procedure until we are satisfied. After that, because we don't see what happened here, we bring the Gracie and we use our tactile sensation for our finger and we pass it over the bone. If we have any irregularity, if the bone, this is, we feel it, we come back with laser and we contour it. And this is sometimes we use the bone file, very uh, micro bone file. This is also, you can use it to smoothing of the bone. In this research, we use the same setting exactly for the flab and the flabless to minimize the variation between the two groups. So in summary, what we have in result, first, clinically, we don't find any difference in the outcome of flab and the flabs. So both give the same clinical result in the follow-up for nine. So we can answer now, flabless is successful and repeatable and predictable procedure like the flab that we know. It. In regard, both the procedure was flab and the flabless was successful to change the gingival margin level. After one month, three months, nine months, there's changing of the margin level and no difference between the result of flab and the flabless group. In regard, any difference between the gingival margin level? We found no change between the three months and nine months. Between one month and three months, when both group, there is changing and there is some kind of tissue rebounding and decreasing of the supragingival tissue dimension. As example, the gingival rebound in both group. As example, after nine months, an open flap was 0 0.25 milli and something 0 0.26 in the flap. So not big difference between two groups. We found there's tissue rebound, but this, but this tissue rebound that we recorded in this research or we documented in this research was less than that was documented in the conventional method. In average, in the muscle study, and who, who follow the same protocol of the flab procedure, they uh, recorded between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 milli the gingival tissue rebound after crown lengthening. This is for all the study who make the suturing of the flab and keep the distance 3 milli between the bone and the new margin of the flab. While the tissue rebound sometimes reach to 2.5 Milli. In the cases when you make the suturing the flap and you place it at the level of the bone. So I think this is one of the recommendations when you make bone reduction with the flap, keep space between the margin of the flap during the suturing and the bone three mil. Because when you don't have this distance, the healing need more time and you have more tissue rebound during the healing. This is example of the conventional method, as I mentioned, that usually the tissue rebound 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, while in our research we found it was this than 0 0.3 in all the cases. And the explanation maybe this is because the laser is an invasive procedure. We have uh, just result uh, regarding the phenotype. When you are dealing with thick phenotype, the rebound was higher. So this is you have to consider during the crown lengthening. For the healing, as I mentioned, no difference for both group between three months and nine months. And all the periodontists around the world, they accept that nine months is more than enough after crown lengthening. And we skip six months because most of the paper dealing with six months. So since, as example, in this central case, the gingival margin, immediate post-operative, after one month, decreased because the tissue is rebounding. After three months, again, rebound, but no difference between three and nine, three and nine. So 
From this, we concluded three months is more than enough for the healing when you have crown lengthening with bone reduction. Now, the most important thing of the patient, what about patient perceptions regarding the morbidity of this procedure? All the patients with the flab list, they scored less pain during the procedure, less pain and stress, less pain after the procedure, during the follow-up, and the functional discomfort was less. And this is was very, uh, the result was very clear about the patient with the flap list preferred over the flap. And this preference, this is reflected about how the patient, they judge about the aesthetic result. All the patient with the flap list procedure, they are more satisfied about the aesthetic result after nine months comparing the flap patient. We mentioned they have the same clinical result, but the patient, because they have good experience, this experience was reflected about how they judge the procedure. So in summary, the flab list is traumatic and minimal invasive procedure, more predictable for the gingival margin, less chair time. The difference between the timing and the flab and the flab list in our research was for uh, 17 minutes. Flabless, less than 17 minutes for chair time. This appointment, you in flabless, you don't need appointment to remove the suture. Better experience for the patient, less post operative discomfort, and shortening the total time of the treatment. But still, we have some disadvantage for the flabless. It needs more experience and skills and need technology. I don't imagine that we can do flabless if you don't have erbium, form, uh, erbium or erbium formula laser. So you need the technology to have the access to the bone. Still blind the procedure. So I recommend, and all our patients, we recommend to have CBCT before, so we can know the topography of the bone before we make this procedure. It will be difficult to do it when you have thick labial bone, but as I mentioned, more than 80% of the cases in the anterior zone, the thickness of the bone is done one mil. Uh, it's difficult to do it when you have functional crown lengthening because in functional crown lengthening, you have to deal with all aspects of the tooth and it will be contraindicated force in all the type two cases for the crown lengthening. Again, just very fast, this is cases after gingival contouring, the bore reduction, this is the healing after three months. With this video, we can see patient, especially with the attrition patient, we can deal, this is now we need, it's functional and aesthetic crown lengthening together. The mock-up, the prosthodontist, Dr. Muhammad Karajuli, he uh, make the, increasing the OVD. He so we know now where the incisal edge will be located after increasing the OVD. And after that, doing the crown lengthening the procedure, and this is the final restoration after three months from the procedure, and this is the final results. Sometimes you can add something more, because we know in the gummy smile, active passive eruption, one of the causative factors, but sometimes you have another factor related about the lip. When you have hyperactive lip, of course you can deal with Botox, but we have another surgery, the lip repositioning surgery. So in this patient, Again, the mock-up, after the mock-up, making the crown lengthening. And remember, when you make aesthetic crown lengthening, check where's the frenum located. So there's a chance now to make frenoplasty. This is the frenoplasty with erbium chromium also. After that, we make the repositioning surgery. We can ablate the distance, uh, the space between mucogingival junction and 12 milli toward the gum and we create this window and then we make the suture, continuous interlock suturing. And this is the patient before and this is the patient immediate after. Another patient who died. So in crown lengthening, we can correct the gingival liver. Now what we have in case we have problem with the color of the gum especially with the patient with high smile line. When we have dark gum and there is no harmony between the color of their gum 
and the color of their skin. As example, here's in Middle East. So we are dealing with the gingival hyperpigmentation, which is usually located in our region, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Africa, and South America. And in this case, this is, again, this is cultural procedure, the depigmentation, depending what the patient want and what about their culture. For some culture, they accepted the dark gum. Some culture, they prefer the pink gum. When you are dealing with hyperpigmentation, we know we are dealing most of the people, they accept that the color of the gum has to be pink. And you have a classification from one to three about how dark the gum will appear. And this uh, hyperpigmentation coming from the melanocyte would produce the melanin and melanin located in the epithelium. All the melanin and melanos, uh, melanocyte located in the epithelium. And the thickness of the epithelium is only 300 microns. So in this case, we know we have two approach how to deal with hyperpigmentation. One approach, we call it selective thermolysis, and this is specific about some kind of diode laser. And the second one, we call it ablative. Ablative means we need to remove the epithelium. We want to make deepithelization. And this one, we can do it with any laser diode, any high power laser. With diode, you can use all this laser. As example, in this case, we are using 940, the EPIC, with 0.8 watt, with 400 micron tip. The procedure we do it, I make the video very fast because we are out of the time. We have initiated tip, 400 micron. We are using 0.8 watt, uh, short pulse duration again, to respect the thermal relaxation of time of the tissue. We are working with the 30 degrees as parallel as to the tissue. And we begin to make ablation and peeling of the epithelium. Again, our target here is only the 300 micron. And I prefer this approach because when you are working as parallel to the tissue, we get information how much we remove from the gum, how the depth of the gum that we removed from the surface, because the, here's the tip 400 micro. When the tip sank completely, we know exactly that we removed the 400 micro. While if you want to make bendicular and target it over that, it's very difficult to do know how the depth and you are targeting your laser to the bone. While in, when you are working parallel, you are targeting your laser to the gingival tissue, so it will be much easier to cooling the area. In this case, is usually in the maxilla using 15 minutes exposure time. You are working usually in foot number six to foot number six. This is one case, patient before, patient one week after, one week after in the lower, with 9.40, this is the healing after one month. Another case before, and this is follow up almost after three years, before and after three years. Now with Airbion, I forget something. With diode, usually, not usually, all the cases we need anesthesia. Because when you initiate the tip, the tip now is hot. So when you touch the fish, it will be painful for the patient. So we need infiltration anesthesia. While with Airbio, one of the main advantage, we don't need anesthesia. But how to use it without anesthesia? First, use the short pulse duration, it's smooth, with heavy water irrigation and increasing the air. This is, will be responsible about cooling the surface so the patient will not reach to the temperature that will causing the damage. I prefer to use 600 micron tip, the MZ6, and we work with the same angulation that we mentioned with diode. And the good thing about the airbion is fast, without anesthesia, and it's clean. It's very easy to distinguish between pigmented area or carbonized area because we don't have carbonization with the airbium when you are using the short pulse duration. While with diode, sometimes this is, will be uh, confusing. This is area is carbonized or uh, remaining pigments. 
So we keep working with this direction, make the four. And again, no need to make a pressure and hard contact. With Airbium, I prefer something to call it near contact. So always you are very near from the tissue and you make this cleaning and the peeling. And this is the, only the amount. And this procedure completely is done without any kind of anesthesia, no topical, no infiltration. But again, as example, when you transfer it to a small 700 micron, the patient will feel with pain. So if the patient feels the pain, the your strategy first, short pulse duration. Second, less frequency, less hertz. If the patient feel pain at 50 hertz, make it 30 hertz. The energy, you don't need to exceed it more than 45 millijoule. So you are dealing with average power two to 2.5 milli in the maximum. So if you are dealing with anesthesia. And the water cooling is very important. Okay. So this is the procedure, how it's done, how to apply it. This is one patient, immediate after. Of course, immediate after, you don't need to give patient any specific instruction, only the conventional oral hygiene instruction. Usually there is no painkiller. No, of course, there's no antibiotic. Because this is, we tell the patient only when you eat something spicy or eat something salty, you feel some kind of discomfort. This is the patient immediate after one month, excuse me, one week and one month. And we can distinguish comparing to the diet, the airbium is faster in the healing. Again, because the airbium is superficial wavelength. And this is the setting we use it in our research that we compare in between airbium and airbium chromium. Another patient before, after, before, after. We published paper in 2021 comparing between Airbium and diode 940, Airbium chromium and diode 940, 60 patients. And we don't find any difference in the clinical result. The only thing in the Airbium, the color of the gum is more vital. We don't have the tail shape that we have it in the diode. But for the preference or patient satisfaction, patient prefer the Airbium because there's no anesthesia. And they like the airbium is faster healing. After one week, they are satisfied about the result. While diode after one week still in the process of the healing, so it needs more time. But after one month, no difference about satisfaction of the patient. This patient, you can see it in the upper, we work in the diode, and lower, we work with the airbium chromium. About the recurrence in the diode, this is the advantage of the diode. The recurrence after two years was 33% of the cases. And the recurrence, it will not be fast. If you are starting with a class three, after two years, you found it to class one. So it will, so to, to start with the, to, to have the recurrence at the same point that you start, sometimes you need more years. While in the airbium, this is case with diode, we follow out five years. While with the airbium, we distinguish that the recurrence was higher. Again, because this is more superficial wavelength, and we write in the paper explanation why the difference and why the recurrence in the airbium higher than the diode. As example, this case in the airbium, the recurrence was in one year. And we found in our research, 75% of the cases had the recurrence after two years. Again, at the end of this presentation, just remember two things what are important in the laser. The laser can achieve what the cutting that the blade can do it, but with laser, you have the coagulation and this is you realized in your eyes. But the laser also adds to another benefit that you can't, you can't see it by your eyes, but you, this is you realized by follow up. The decontamination with laser procedure, we don't need uh, most of the cases antibiotic. We control the bacteria in this area. And the most important thing, the biostimulation, the healing process and the discomfort after the laser procedure will be the healing faster and discomfort less. But of course, again, at the end, you need to know how to do this procedure, how to get the precise ablation, but without causing the thermal damage. This is how to pick up the correct wavelength, how to use the correct setting to avoid 
any uh, damage, especially when you are dealing with the bone. Because we don't need to finish with cases like this. Especially this is happening with diode. If you don't control, if you don't choose the correct setting, like example, using a continuous uh, mode with diode is dangerous because you don't have, uh, you don't give the tissue the time to relax. Uh, this is the reference of my presentation. Uh, we published uh, the book. I have the same chapter. I have chapter talking about laser using in the periodontal aesthetic, the same topic of this uh, webinar. This is, you found it in this book. So I was published at the end of last year. Uh, the main editor was Dr. Professor Giorgio Romax. And at the end, uh, as Dr. Lau mentioned, we welcome you in the ALD conference. This is, will be in Dallas in April. Uh, this will be the celebrity of 30 years anniversary. We are looking to see you there. Uh, we will have courses. We have one course about the crown lengthening and we have different courses will be running uh, alongside this uh, conference. And hopefully we can see you there, uh, not virtually, uh, face to face, we can meet, we can discuss and we can get information. And at the end, thank you. Just, uh, just tell you, this is my family here. We are now, I am living in Qatar, but my origin from Algeria and Palestine. This is my father. He was born in 1931. And this is our village in Palestine and 31. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Walid. Uh, actually, some of the questions that were asked, <clears throat> you basically answered. Um, but one, um, let's look at a couple of them. Uh, one is um, about crown lengthening and not restore the teeth. So you can do crown lengthening and not have to do restorations, correct? If the. Yes, if, yeah, yes, yes, of course. Of course. We have many patients. Uh, when you have active passive eruption, you have gummy smite and you have uh, you don't have problem with the teeth and the color of the shaving or uh, lining. Yes, of course. And this is the most of the cases. Especially yeah. uh, when you are talking about active passive eruption, the percentage is something around 15%. Right. So, yes, of course. So, um, I have uh, been asked this and also we have a question about this. You know, sometimes on the depigmentation, the melanin is very, very deep into the tissue. So how do you judge uh, so that you do not touch the bone uh, with the laser and literally create some type of inflammation of the bone? So when you're doing this, have you ever seen very thin gingival phenotype and the melanin very close to the bone to where you actually had to compromise so that you would not expose the bone? Yeah, of course, in some cases uh, we have, when you have uh, thin periodontal phenotype, sometimes the thickness of the gum is than one mil. Uh, we know it's very clear in the buccal bone, uh, excuse me, the buccal gum, the thickness of the epithelium, 300 micron. But with the shape of the epithelium, do you remember we have the bags, the epithelial bags. So sometimes you, you have some remaining pigment because it will be very near to the bone. But in all my experience, when you remove 0 0.5 milli from thickness of the gum, it will be completely eliminate because we don't have in the publication or the experience or in the histology studies, we don't have cases that mention that we have the melanin inside the connective tissue. This is another story. So the challenge only when you have thin phenotype, and this is very clearly, you can define it with the patient because uh, when the patient has this thin phenotype. And this is my recommendation. When you are working in parallel to the tissue, First, no need to use high power, high wattage. I know there's some publication they're using three watts. This is too much. 
Again, depigmentation is ablative procedure, so you can't see it in your eyes. So since you are making the peeling with 0 0.8, actually in 0 0.6, you can make the peeling. In our research, we use 0 0.8. So use lower wattage. The second thing, direction of the tip, not to the bone, parallel. So now you have information about the thickness that you remove. The problem it's happening when you are working bendicular, sometimes you go deeper. And the same time you direct your laser and they direct all the thermal damage to the bone. Uh, yes, there is chance to have bone necrosis if you, don't, if you are using high power. The last thing that I want to mention, because there's many publication, they're using the continuous with diode. I don't understand why. When you are using the continuous with diode, diodes that Increasing of the temperature of the tissue after one millilitre to up to eight degrees, which is dangerous to the bone because we know the critical threshold for the bone, 10 degrees. So what you need to, how to compensate this? To compensate it by using short duty cycle, make the pulse period more than the thermal relaxation of the tissue and short pulse duration. So don't use frequency more than 1,000 in general. This is in our paper, or this is what you found. Every time when you are exceeding more than 1 hertz, 1,000 hertz in the frequency, there is high chance to get the same effect you have it with continuous. So by this way, you can avoid the thermal damage. Well, I, you know, I, I really appreciate you bringing in about the physics with lasers. Um, it's not that, uh, you know, when you're in the Academy of Laser Dentistry, you're a little bit of a laser aficionado and you, we get a little strange on the settings, but I hope all of uh, the folks on the audience uh, appreciate when you were talking about the power and the hertz and the millijoules, uh, because it is a tissue reaction. Uh, while yes. this was just Excellent. I really, really appreciate it. I think we got, I really, the one thing is that you're able to integrate uh, why we're doing it, but more importantly, you demonstrated to show us how we do it. So I really, really thank you for sharing your, your knowledge base with us on both the gingival depigmentation and aesthetic crown lengthening. Uh, Thank you. So, there's, two, there's a couple of questions I can answer very fast. One question about follow up with Airbion, and our research was for follow up for two years. Right. So this is uh, this one. And about how to use with localized area with very deep melanin pigmentation. Mostly we are dealing here with not, not physiologic pigmentation, hyperpigmentation, sometimes about staining coming from uh, metal uh, restoration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is a nice protocol published by uh, Aoki to last years. He insert the tip and make it like a punch inside the tissue with air biom laser. And this is, will be enough to deal with this uh, procedure. So we don't apply it deeply because th this is when you are, have the tattoo inside the tissue, this is in connective tissue. So I don't make it a second one, just make it like a fractional hand piece. Of course, it's not a fractional. Picking up small diameter tip and make like punch, different punch inside this area. Maybe you need more than one appointment to deal with these cases. This is very conservative way how to deal with non-physiologic pigmentation when you have it inside the connective tissue. Right. Yeah, we always suggest that when you do your first depigmentation, that you do it in a posterior area uh, that the patient uh, cannot see and that you tell them that you're trying it out, um, but you do it in an area to get the practice actually. And then when you get to where you feel comfortable with it, uh, because both of, these, both of these subjects, patients can see. It's one thing doing crown lengthening in the posterior. Here we're doing something to where patients can see. And you brought that out very, very well uh, on the emphasis of the smile. Waleed, thank you very, very much for sharing with us. So Joe, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. 
Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Lau. And thank you, Dr. Al Tayyab. I uh, appreciate uh, the meaningful content and the meaningful session here. And I appreciate you making sure that we answered all of the questions that our nice audience posed to us. Um, before we go, uh, I wanted to, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our session, just for one minute, show uh, the audience where you can find some really nice resources on BioLase.com. And if you go to the procedures section of our homepage, you'll see a treasure trove of information there on different disciplines, with the newest discipline being the bottom, uh, the, the bottom selection there of gum depigmentation. Uh, now, an easy way to get to our brand new Waterlays gum depigmentation protocol guide is to go to biolase.com backslash gum depig protocol, and it'll take you directly to a site that you can download a PDF copy of this new protocol guide. Now, once you download the protocol guide, the content in it will give you an, an explanation of the procedure, uh, case acceptance information and guidance, case selection guidance, and a step-by-step -step protocol, including uh, coding guidance and, and uh, coding information. So uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, this lecture and this seminar, I would encourage you to go to biolase.com and download this brand new protocol that we have for you from BioLase Education. One last area of resources, if you do go to the resources menu on the homepage, you'll find uh, webinars. So webinars on demand is our webinar library where this webinar will be recorded in the future for you to reference. We also have clinical technique animation videos that you can reference. And one of our newest uh, venues is it, our Advancing Dentistry podcast series, which can be found in the resources section as well. Lastly, if you go to education and training and on-demand training, if you want to continue your, your, your education journey in laser dentistry, I would encourage you to go to on-demand training at biolase.com.